Hello, welcome to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in physiology or medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I'm a postdoctoral scientist at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle, and I will be your host for this web series. Now, the purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize, and for scientists, the highest prize is the Nobel Prize. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to treat diseases. Today, we will be examining one half of the 2008 prize in physiology or medicine, which was awarded to Harold Zurhausen. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Zurhausen the award, quote, for his discovery of human papillomaviruses causing cervical cancer, unquote. We'll be going over some of the history of cervical cancer, including the use of pap smears to screen for cervical cancer, and we'll be talking about Zurhausen's discovery of HPV DNA in cervical cancer cells and the development of highly effective HPV vaccines. But first, a little bit of background on Zurhausen. Harold Zurhausen was born in 1936 in the city of Glessenkirchen in the North Rhine-Westphalia state of Germany. His childhood education was interrupted by World War II, and the gaps in his elementary school education hampered him a bit when he started high school. But he made up the difference quickly. After graduating high school, he attended the University of Bonn. Like many people interested in biology, he was torn between a desire to study medicine or the natural sciences. He ended up choosing medicine, and after transferring to Heinrich Hein University in Dusseldorf, he graduated with his medical degree in 1960. He spent two years as a medical resident and became a fully licensed medical doctor. However, he still wanted to do science, so after completing residency, he accepted a position as a laboratory assistant at the Institute for Microbiology at the University of Dusseldorf. He quickly realized that though his medical training had taught him a great deal, his scientific education was lacking. He therefore decided to look for a postdoctoral position that could give him a good grounding in infectious diseases and microbiology. In 1965, he accepted a position at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia in the laboratory of Werner and Gertrude Henley, who were German emigrants working in the United States. It was an excellent time for him to start work. The Henleys were talented virologists. And when Zurhausen arrived in Philadelphia, he joined them in their study of the newly discovered Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus was highly correlated with Burkitt's lymphoma and was a suspected oncovirus. In 1968, the Henleys demonstrated that Epstein-Barr virus could turn normal human cells into cancer cells, thus showing that Epstein-Barr virus was indeed an oncovirus. They also demonstrated that Epstein-Barr virus was the responsible agent for infectious mononucleosis, or often just called mono. So Zurhausen got an excellent grounding for himself in medical virology. Then in 1969, he accepted a position to start his own lab in the Institute for Virology at the University of Würzburg back in Germany. He continued to work on Epstein-Barr virus, and he demonstrated that the virus DNA ended up incorporated into the DNA of the cancer cell. In 1972, he was appointed chairman of the newly established Institute of Clinical Virology in Erlangen-Nürnberg. He moved his lab and decided to shift his research into the study of cervical cancer. He again moved his lab in 1977 when he was appointed chairman of the Institute of Virology at the University of Freiburg, and it was there that he would continue his work on cervical cancer and make his Nobel Prize winning discovery. So, what was known about cervical cancer before Zurhausen's discovery? Well, at the start of the 20th century, uterine and cervical cancers were responsible for more cancer deaths among women than any other cancer type, including breast cancer and lung cancer. At the time, surgery to remove the cervix, or a total hysterectomy that removed the cervix and uterus, were considered the best options for patients diagnosed with cervical cancer. However, most of the time, these treatments arrived too late to save the patient, and the five-year survival rate from cervical cancer was only about 
In the 1930s, 21% of cancer deaths in women were uterine or cervical cancers, which amounted to about 40,000 deaths each year. Cancer was still poorly understood, scientists were a long way from understanding cancer as a genetic disease, and were highly divided studying the many possible causes of cancer. However, in the midst of the uncertainty about how to treat or understand cancer, an important discovery was made in cancer diagnostics that would dramatically reduce cervical cancer deaths. In 1914, a physician named George Pepin Nicolaou arrived at the Medical College of Cornell University in New York. He had recently immigrated to the U.S. from Greece and had accepted a research position at the university's anatomy department. Pepin Nicolaou's area of study was the menstrual cycle, and he was studying menstruation in guinea pigs. He developed a simple technique to scrape cervical cells from the animals and then smear the cells onto a glass slide. The cells were then stained and examined under a microscope. He saw that the size and shape of the cervical cells changed based on the stage of the menstrual cycle. He tried the technique on human patients and observed a similar effect, and he could precisely determine where a woman was in her menstrual cycle by looking at the appearance of the cervical cells. Of course, his test didn't have much practical value at first. Women knew how to time their menstrual cycles perfectly well without having their cervical cells looked at. Papa Nicolau therefore decided to take his test, and rather than look at healthy cervical cells, he began looking at unhealthy cervical cells. He collected samples from women suffering from a wide range of gynecological diseases, over time, he began to notice differences in cervical cancer cells compared to healthy cells. The cells had larger nuclei and less cytoplasm, among other structural changes. In 1928, he published his test as a method for detecting cervical cancer. However, his test was widely rejected by the medical community. If a doctor suspected a case of cervical cancer, they preferred to take a biopsy of the cervix and examine the cervical tissue for cancer under a microscope. The biopsy was a much more accurate method of detection than Papanicolaou's smear. Papanicolaou's test would sometimes give false negative results, which means it failed to detect the cancer on occasion. Granted, a biopsy was a more difficult and invasive procedure to perform than brushing the surface of the cervix, but the accuracy of the test made the biopsy the preferred choice for doctors. Frustrated, Papa Nicolau returned to his lab and his slides. He spent the better part of the next two decades meticulously examining his slides and his smears. His work would go largely unpublished and unrecognized during this time, and he became something of a hermit, retreating from the wider scientific world. Slowly, a new idea began to take hold in the back of Papa Nicolau's mind. Doctors would perform a biopsy to check for cervical cancer after a patient came to them with symptoms of cervical cancer, such as vaginal bleeding between periods. Generally, by the time cervical cancer was diagnosed, the options for the patient were limited and the mortality rate was high. Usually, by the time the cancer was discovered, it had become invasive and metastatic, spreading to other parts of the body. But what if the cancer could be detected before women developed symptoms? What if the cancer could be detected before it became invasive? Poring over his smears, Papa Nicolau began to notice subtle changes in the cervical cells. He was able to develop a scale that marked the progression of a cervical cell from normal to abnormal, from abnormal to precancerous, and from precancerous to cancerous. He didn't know it, but he was observing the slow accumulation of mutations in the cell as it transitioned to a cancer cell, a process that could take 10 to 20 years. These changes could be observed in cervical biopsies as well, but again, the biopsies were more difficult and invasive to perform and could not be widely used. On the other hand, the smear test was much easier to do. Papa Nicolau reasoned that while his test may not be as accurate as the biopsies, it could detect cancer at stages early enough for interventions to be effective, and by distributing the test widely, it had the potential to save lives. In 1952, Papa Nicolau received funding from the NIH to run a full clinical trial with his test, 
a test which is now called the pap smear. Approximately 150,000 women were enrolled in the study, and at its peak, the team on the trial could analyze a thousand smears each day. When the results came back, invasive cervical cancer was detected in 555 women in the trial. These cancers were not easily curable since they had already metastasized and spread beyond the point of their origin, but an additional 557 women in the trial were found to have early stage pre-invasive cancers that had not metastasized. These women had no cancer symptoms, and under the available standard of care at the time, they would not have found out about their abnormal cells until it was too late. However, detecting the abnormal cells early with the pap smear meant their tumors could be removed by a simple surgical procedure before the tumor had a chance to progress to invasive cancer, thus saving the lives of the women who got treatment. Starting in the 1950s, pap smear testing for women became widespread in the United States and Europe. It was initially recommended to get tested as part of a yearly checkup, but in the 1980s the recommendation was changed to every three years starting at age 20. The payoff of widespread testing was a steady decline in cervical cancer deaths. Between the years 1940 and 2000, Cervical cancer deaths in the U.S. dropped over 70% to around 8,000 deaths per year. Early detection with the pap smears had turned a once highly deadly disease into a predominantly preventable disease. Papa Nicolau's work was noticed by his peers, and he was nominated five times for a Nobel Prize, though he sadly passed away in 1962 without winning the top award. However, there would eventually be a Nobel Prize for work on cervical cancer. While pap smears were, and still are, a fantastic tool for preventing metastatic cervical cancer, the pap smear is what's known as a type of secondary prevention. Secondary prevention involves the early detection of a disease and treating it before symptoms can develop. Another example of this type of prevention would be something like contact tracing for infectious diseases. But there's another layer of prevention that's even better than secondary prevention, and that's primary prevention. While secondary prevention blocks a disease from progressing, primary prevention blocks the disease from occurring in the first place. But as we've talked about on previous episodes of this podcast, scientists in the mid-20th century were divided regarding the primary cause of cancer. There seemed to be a wide range of possible causes, things like genetic predispositions to certain types of cancer, abiotic causes, and even to things like infectious diseases. While all these different theories were eventually united with the understanding of cancer as essentially a genetic disease, the viral origin of cancer was dominant for much of the 20th century. The discovery of Epstein-Barr virus as the first human oncovirus expanded interest in the role of viruses in human cancers. This brings us back to Harold Zerhausen and his work on human papillomaviruses. As mentioned earlier, Harold Zerhausen had worked with the Henleys on Epstein-Barr virus and was interested in the viral origins of cancer, specifically cervical cancer. Several viruses were known to infect the genitals and reproductive organs, and scientists wondered if any of these known viruses might also be responsible for cervical cancer. A chief suspect in the early 1970s was herpes simplex virus 2, or HSV2, a virus with a DNA genome that causes genital warts. To establish a correlation between HSV2 and cervical cancer, Scientists, including Zerhausen, decided to check cervical cancer cells for the presence of HSV2 DNA. Unfortunately, they didn't have access to the super awesome instruments that we use today for amplifying and sequencing DNA. Instead, they made use of radioactive DNA probes that came from known viral DNA. We talked about this radioactive probe technique on episode 16 of this podcast, but here's a recap of how it works. DNA exists as two complementary strands made up of molecules called nucleotides. These strands come together to form a double helix, and each strand of DNA binds specifically to the other strand. The specificity of the DNA is determined by the DNA's sequence, and the sequence is made up of the arrangement of nucleotides. 
DNA molecules with high sequence similarity will bind to each other, while sequences with low similarity either won't bind to each other or will bind very poorly, depending on the degree of similarity. Zurhausen and his team could take their radioactive DNA probe made from viral DNA and add it to DNA taken from cervical cancer cells. If the tumor cells had the virus, the probe would bind to the viral DNA and the scientists would detect a radioactive signal. If the tumor cell was not infected, they would not detect a radioactive signal. Zurhausen took his technique and did a screen of cervical cancer cells for HSV2 DNA, and the result came back negative. None of the cervical cancer cells they tested were infected with HSV2. Negative results in research are common, but it's still pretty discouraging when it happens. But Zurhausen didn't give up. Instead, he turned his attention to a different group of viruses, the papillomaviruses. Human papillomavirus, or HPV, had been known for several decades. The defining feature of human papillomaviruses was their ability to form, well, papillomas. The word papilloma is a hybrid word. Papilla is the Latin word for nipple, and the Greek suffix oma in this context means tumor. So a papilloma is a small raised tumor or wart, looks kind of like a nipple, I guess. In the early part of the 20th century, it was discovered that papillomaviruses were the cause of skin warts in both humans and animals. Zurhausen wondered if they might also be the cause of human genital warts. In 1980, he was able to isolate papillomavirus DNA from human genital warts. The DNA was sufficiently different to classify the virus as a new species of papillomavirus, which Zurhausen called HPV type 6. He used the DNA from HPV6 to make radioactive DNA probes, and he began screening more genital warts for the virus. He continued to find HPV6 DNA in a small but significant fraction of his samples, but he also noticed that sometimes the radioactive signal coming from the samples was there, but rather weak. This indicated to Zerhausen that there was HPV DNA in the warts, but it wasn't HPV6 DNA since HPV6 DNA would give a strong signal. Instead, the weak signal was coming from a new species of HPV, which Zerhausen named HPV11. Having shown that HPV6 and 11 were regular causes of genital warts, Zerhausen once again turned his attention to cervical cancer. Using his radioactive DNA probes, he checked the cervical cancer cells for human papillomavirus DNA. This time, he got a match. Out of the 41 samples of cervical cancer that he checked, a little over 50% of the samples were positive for HPV DNA. Interestingly, most of the positive samples contained DNA from another new type of HPV, which Zerhausen dubbed HPV-16. The results were published in the journal PNAS in 1983. While they were well received, there was more work to do. A slightly higher than 50% positivity rate among the samples was cool, but not a particularly strong correlation between HPV and cervical cancer. But Zerhausen wasn't done yet. The 1983 paper includes the following sentence, quote, We do expect that characterization of further types of HPV will increase the percentage of positive tumors, unquote. This sentence was exactly right. Less than a year later, Zerhausen's group published a second paper describing the isolation of a new species of HPV they had recently isolated from cervical cancer. This new species got the name HPV-18. When they screened 49 different cervical cancer samples for DNA from all the known HPV types up until that point, 83% of the samples were positive for HPV DNA. So now things were getting interesting. Zerhausen had shown a strong correlation between the presence of HPV DNA and cervical cancer cells. More people began looking for HPV DNA in cervical cancer, and as tools for detecting viral DNA improved, so did the detection of HPV in cervical cancer cells. It gradually became clear that nearly all cervical cancers contain HPV DNA, while HPV was only detected in a small fraction of samples from healthy cervical cells. With the help of modern tools for sequencing DNA, it also became apparent that the virus types isolated by Zerhausen 
HPV 16 and 18, made up about 70% of all positive samples, indicating that these might be particularly high-risk species of the virus. These results strongly suggested that HPV causes cervical cancer. But as strong as the correlation was, as the saying goes, correlation does not equal causation. Particularly intriguing was the fact that much like Epstein-Barr virus, not everyone infected with HPV develops cancer, which might have been expected to raise questions about HPV's status as an oncovirus. The explanation that has emerged for why not everyone who gets infected with HPV gets cancer is that HPV infection is a necessary but not sufficient cause of cervical cancer. In other words, Papanicolaou's observations that cervical cancer progresses in stages fits with the genetic understanding of cancer, that multiple genes need to be mutated before a cell becomes truly cancerous. HPV infection puts a cell on that path to cancer, and so it's a direct cause of cervical cancer but accumulating the other mutations takes time. Unfortunately, the details of how cells accumulate these extra mutations is still a bit of a mystery and an active area of research. Nevertheless, though, researchers wanted to show definitively that HPV causes cervical cancer. One way to go about doing this involves the use of animal models of HPV infection. However, HPV is a highly human-specific pathogen, So researchers have used other papillomaviruses of rabbits and cows to study cancer progression in those species. In these other animals, infection with papillomaviruses can be shown to cause cancer. Experiments in cell culture further strengthen the link between HPV and cancer, and it has been shown that two viral proteins function as oncogenes to drive tumor genesis. By the early 2000s, the scientific community was convinced that HPV caused cervical cancer. For his contributions to this finding, Harold Zurhausen was awarded one half of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Since that time, we have even better reasons to believe that HPV causes cancer, thanks to the development of HPV vaccines. HPV vaccine development began as early as 1991, But it took a while to convince vaccine companies there was a market for HPV vaccines, or that an HPV vaccine would even be successful. A patent battle between four different labs also helped slow the process of getting the vaccines off the ground. But in 2006, the pharmaceutical company Merck obtained FDA approval for their HPV vaccine, which goes by the name Gardasil. A year later, the pharma company GlaxoSmithKline released their HPV vaccine, which is marketed under the name Cervarix. The Cervarix vaccine targets the most common HPV types found in cervical cancer, namely types 16 and 18. Gardasil, on the other hand, targets types 6, 11, 16, and 18, thus giving it a wider range of coverage than Cervarix. In 2014, Merck released an updated version of Gardasil called Gardasil 9 that protects against an additional five types of HPV. Gardasil 9 became the vaccine of choice in the U.S., and since 2016, it is the only HPV vaccine available in this country. In the Phase 3 clinical trial for Gardasil, volunteers were given either the vaccine or placebo, and then checked for precancerous cervical cells by pap smears over the next three years. The trial found that in the vaccine group, there was a 98% reduction in precancerous cervical lesions caused by HPV types 16 and 18. An even bigger study in Sweden was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020, where over 1.6 million girls and women were assessed for their development of cervical cancer. The authors found that girls vaccinated before the age of 17 reduced their risk of invasive cervical cancer by 88%. That's pretty awesome! And these vaccine studies are the best evidence to date that HPV causes cervical cancer. So let me wrap up today's episode by summarizing the current understanding of HPV and cervical cancer and the current recommendations from the CDC to protect against cervical cancer. Human papillomaviruses are a large family of viruses with DNA genomes that can sometimes cause persistent infections. 
Of the over 100 different types of HPV, at least a dozen are highly associated with cancer, and types 16 and 18 in particular are known causative agents of cervical cancer. Infection with HPV is not a guarantee that cancer will develop, as cells normally require additional mutations after HPV infection to become fully cancerous, and the immune system can also assist in clearing the infection before cancer develops. However, infection with HPV can start the cell on a path to becoming a cancer cell. Cervical cancer cells infected with HPV go through several stages as they transition to cancer cells, starting out from normal, then becoming abnormal, then going from abnormal to precancerous, and finally from precancerous to fully blown cancer cells. These changes can take a decade or more to occur, and the changes can be detected by pap smear testing. The current recommendation is that everyone with a cervix aged 21 to 65 should get a pap smear every 3 to 5 years for regular screening for cervical cancer. Additionally, the CDC recommends everyone, both men and women, get vaccinated against HPV, and currently recommends vaccination at age 12. The vaccines have been shown to be highly safe and effective at preventing HPV-associated cancers, and the current Gardasil 9 vaccine protects against 9 HPV types that together account for about 90% of cervical cancers. With increased screening and increased HPV vaccination, we can expect the number of cervical cancer cases to continue to decline in the years and decades ahead. So that concludes this episode of Notable Novels. This episode was recorded on May 6, 2023. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. Next time, we'll be continuing to talk about viruses, and we'll be talking about another virus linked to human cancer. And I'm particularly excited to talk about this one because it's the virus I'm actively working on in the lab right now. So want to know more? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you then.